as in a hadith which are mentioned from the Shia school of thoughts books will be on the authority of my Shaykh a Sayyid Ayatollah Muhammad Rada Jalali and any narrations and a hadith which are mentioned from the Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah school of thoughts books will be the, on the authority of individuals like Sheikh Nasruddin Albani and Sheikh Zubair al Ziyai. Similar is the case for any historical events within the Maqatil. They will be read from authentic and reliable sources such as Lahuf of Sayyid ibn Tawus and also that renowned from the pulpit, read by sound and reliable reciters. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. For the hastening of the reappearance of the 12th Imam, recite aloud the salawat. With the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find ourselves beginning the Islamic year. Unlike other races, cultures and religions, we as Muslims and the lovers of the Ahl al-Bayt salam commence the year with sorrow, with mourning, with bereavement. We begin the year with the remembrance of Hussein. We find that Badsha Hussein in his English tafsir says that sorrow is something which is self-abating. In psychology, there's a term used for something which over time dilutes. For example, if I lose a close relative the first few days, I'm very sorrowful. Even within the whole year, I remember them. But as time passes, the psychologists say that this is self-abating. One does not desire to keep this sorrow within them. So within the passing of time, it becomes diluted of less quality one does not remember that individual as much. But the miracle of Hussein alayhi afdal salati was salam is that as our recognition of the Imam increases and our knowledge of Islam increases, we find that this does not self-abate oneself. And we find that the quality of Azadari and the commemoration increases. We find that when we increase our knowledge about the events which took place in the 61st year of Hijrah, even though many, many years have passed, this is such a sacrifice that by year, by year, in our remembrance, we are getting closer to Hussein. The quality of our remembrance is getting stronger. It's getting more concentrated. That's the first point. Secondly, we find that this establishment of Majalis is something very, very important. And we find that the shedding of tears in the remembrance of the love of and the tragedies of the Ahl al-Bayt is our duty. Brothers and sisters, because tonight is the first lecture, I want to make you aware of the etiquettes of Muharram. I want to lay down some foundations for the following nights. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Crying 
is usually done by those individuals who have lost someone. Therefore, because Hussein is killed, it's upon the Holy Prophet to cry. It's upon his father Amir al muminin to cry. It's upon his mother Sayyid Zahra to cry. Upon his brother to cry. This is what we are doing when we commemorate the tragedy and those events which took place. This is something that the Prophet, this is something that Imam Ali, this is something that Sayyid Zahra and Imam Hassan yearned to do. And to prove this, there's a very famous narration which we find in the books of our brothers as well, like Tirmidhi, where the Prophet is sitting on his right knee is Imam Hassan alayhi salam. On his left knee is Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The Prophet turns his face to Imam Hassan and kisses Imam Hassan on the face. After seeing this, Sayyidu Shuhada turns to his grandfather and is waiting for his grandfather to also kiss him on the face. The Prophet turns the face of Imam Hussein and kisses him on his neck. This didn't happen once or twice, brothers and sisters. On the third time, Imam Hussein thought, what is the reason that when my grandfather kisses my brother, he kisses his face? But when he kisses me, he kisses my neck. Hussein begins to cry. He was very young at this time, and he runs to where his mother Zahra was sitting. Hussein goes and says, Oh mother, this is what happened. Every time I want my grandfather to kiss my face, he kisses my neck. What is the reason for this? Say the Zahra begins to cry as well. She could not bear to see Hussein cry. Then they both go to the presence of the Holy Prophet. Zahra says to her father, Oh father, what is the reason that when you kiss Hassan, you kiss him on the face? But when you kiss Hussein, you move his face and kiss him on the neck. The Prophet says, Oh my daughter, do you want to know the reason why? She says, yes. The Prophet says, then sit and call Ali. Ali, take care of Zahra, for I am about to inform you why I have done so. The Prophet says, Oh Zahra, just now Jibra'il came to me. And he said, Oh Messenger of God, this grandson of yours will be killed on the plains of Karbala after being hungry and thirsty for three days. After hearing this, she was a mother. Zahra began to tremble. She could not hold back her tears. After she was crying, she was crying. She asked the Prophet, Oh Father, what will be the reason that my Hussein will be killed? The Prophet says, Oh Zahra, your son Hussein will be innocent. For no crime will he be killed. Then Zahra says that when my Hussein will be killed, Oh Father, will you be present? The Prophet says, no, my beloved daughter, I will not be present. Zahra says, oh father, what about Abu Hassan? Will he be present when Hussein will be killed? He says, no, Zahra, Ali also will not be present. What about Hassan? He will not be present. What about myself? Zahra, not even you will be present. خَالٍ عَنِّي وَعَنْكِ وَعَنْ عَلِيٍ وَعَنِ الْحَسَنِ None of us will be there. Do you know what Zahra asked? She said, Oh Father, if none of us will be there, then who will cry for Hussein? Allahu Akbar. A mother asks, Oh Father, when my Hussein will be killed and he is innocent, and he has not committed an offense. Who will cry for my Hussein? 
The Prophet says, O oh my daughter, do not worry. For God Almighty will create a nation. Within the nation, the children will cry for your children. The elderly will cry for your elderly. The youth will cry for your youth. And the women will cry for your daughters. After hearing this, Hussein goes to his grandfather and says to the Prophet, O oh Prophet, O oh grandfather, those that cry for me, what will you reward them? Know your position, brothers and sisters. And this is why I'm reciting this riwayah, so you know why we have come here tonight. Hussein asks his grandfather, O oh grandfather, what will you give to those who cry for me? He says, O oh Hussein, I am Shafi' Yawm al Jaza. I will intercede for them and make sure that their path is towards heaven. Then Hussein goes to his father. He says, O oh father, what will you give to those individuals that shed tears for me? Imam Ali says that I am Saki Kawthar. I will dr give them drinks from the pond of Kawthar. Then Hussein goes to his brother Hassan. Oh my beloved brother Hassan, what will you give to those that cry after my tragedy? Imam Hassan says that I am the master of the youth of paradise. I will give those that cry paradise. Then Hussein comes to his mother and he says, Oh mother, what will you give to those individuals that cry for me? Zahra says, I am a sorrowful mother, what can I give? But Hussein, I promise you that I will stand outside heaven and will, I will not enter until all of those individuals that have cried for you have entered, then I will enter after them. Brothers and sisters, glad tidings to all of you. How lucky you are to be amongst those who Zahra prays for. How lucky are you to be amongst those whose names are in that list who cry for Hussein. This is the tawfiq that you have, brothers and sisters. Thank your parents. You're lucky that you were born in a household where your mothers and fathers had love and reverence for Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Ask those brothers and sisters who have converted and come into the fold of Islam and accepted the Shia school of thought how difficult it is to find this door. And because you have been given it on a plate, as we say, you do not give it value. Make sure you know what the value of sitting on these planes are. This is an opportunity that many of our, the brothers and sisters that might have sat next to us last year are not here this year. And we find that life was not loyal to them. And they are no longer amongst us and amongst those who have the opportunity to cry for Hussein. Amongst those who commemorate the tragedy of Karbala. We find that in the time of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi abdul salati was salam, a majlis had just finished in the residence of the Imam himself. The reciter recited and those that cried had cried. The Imam comes to his companion by the name of Abu Basir, a very noble and respected individual. And he says, the Imam says to him, Oh Abu Basir, why do you not cry for my Jad, for my grandfather Hussein? He says, Oh Master, 
Look at my handkerchief is drenched with tears. I cry for your grandfather Hussein. The Imam says, don't cry like this. He says, cry like an elderly mother cries at the body of her young son. Cry like that for Hussein. Do not be ashamed, do not be shy. Like I said, this is something that the Ahlul Bayt yearned and desired to do. Also we find in the time of the 8th Imam, Imam Ali al-Rada alayhi afdara salati wa salam. One of his companions came to him, his Shia. The riwayah says Shia. This riwayah is mentioned in the Ayun Akhbar of Sheikh Sudduq alayhi rahmati wa radhwan, volume 2, page 275. His companion, his Shia, comes to the Imam and the Imam asks him a question. He says, do you ever come together and sit and discuss about Islam? The companion of the Imam said, yes, we are your Shias, we sit together and we discuss about Islam. He said, when you have discussed about Islam and the different sciences, do you remember the tragedy of my grandfather Hussein? He says, oh yes, master, we remember the tragedy of your grandfather Hussein. The Imam raises his hands. And he says, Arahimallahu man ahya amrana. The Imam, the Imam, eighth Imam says, May Allah have mercy on those individuals that revive our command. You are amongst those individuals that come out of your busy lives, I am aware. Whether you are in school, college, university, in the workplace. How beautiful is it that you schedule your timetable so that you can attend these lectures, so you can attend this azadari. The Imam is someone who is praying for you. Rahimallahu man ahya amrana. The eighth Imam says that may God have mercy upon those that revive our command. Also amongst the etiquettes of Muharram brothers and sisters, is that some of us, we have worldly attributes. For example, we are from wealthy families, we have a good job, we are doctors, engineers, nurses. Our teachers say that when you sit on the pulpit, tell your audience that when you leave home, leave these qualities and attributes at home. That I am Shah Saab, I am Malik Saab, I am Chaudhary Saab. These titles you have, these attributes that are for the world, leave them at home. Come to the Majalis as a gharib, someone humble, with dignity, like your Master Hussein. And they say that when you return home, those attributes will be preserved there. Once you get home, make use of those attributes. But when you come to the majalis, make sure you do not come as someone arrogant. Come as someone humble. Also, brothers and sisters, we find that amongst the etiquettes of Muharram and the Azadari that we commemorate, is making sure you understand why you are here. It's a very important point. Like I said, these are the foundations for the following lectures that are to come. It's very important that you listen to these points because every lecture will refer to one of these points that I've mentioned. These are the foundations that I'm laying for the coming nights. It's vital that when you are coming here, you know why you are coming here. This gathering, brothers and sisters, is not the fulfillment of a tradition. This is not a rasm. It's not a custom. If anything, this 
is the fulfillment of duties and responsibilities. I'm saying something. When you come and you come to the majalis, make sure that you are coming with the intention that you are fulfilling your responsibility. Our teachers say that when sitting on the pulpit and addressing the people, ask yourself, what is it that the people give to you? Everyone's attention on this point. I as a speaker have to ask this question. What is it that every single individual is giving to me? And you are giving me something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 106, the first verse swears upon. Wal'asr. You are giving me your time. Time is so important, brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a whole verse taking the oath upon it. Our teachers say that the audience members that are sitting and listening to you, they give you the gift of time, which is so valuable to one. Time is everything. So on the basis of chapter Ar-Rahman, verse 60, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Hal Jazaul Ihsan, Illa Al-Ihsan, the fact that you are giving me your time, and you are doing Ihsan to me, the recompense and return of something good is good. Therefore, I as a speaker have the responsibility of giving in return to your time something which is worth more than life itself. And what is worth more than life? Than the teachings of Islam. Than the religion of Islam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In return for your time, it is my duty to give you lessons from Islam, from the sciences entrusted within Islam. And just to clarify how important religion is, it makes me tremble when I think of this myself. If you want to know the value of Islam, brothers and sisters, if you want to know the value of Islam, Islam is a religion so valuable that someone like Hussein can be sacrificed for Islam. This is the value of religion. That someone like Hussein, and what do we know who Hussein is? It reminds me of the poet who said that the Shias come and commemorate, has their love not diluted? We reply by saying that we commemorate Hussein because we have no knowledge but recognition. We have not even recognized the conversion of Hur, never mind understanding who Hussein is. This is the value of religion. That the apple of Zahra's eye can be sacrificed for religion. Therefore, I have a duty that I give you lessons from this religion. And also, now that it's come up, I'll mention it. We find within the communities, especially in the subcontinent, that people tend to come in the later nights. Five, six, seven and onwards. They attend those nights and they don't give as much importance to maybe the first four or five nights. Within our research and within our planning for these Majalis brothers and sisters, we have made the effort of trying to discuss a new subject every single night. Some speakers, they take one subject and they discuss the same subject in different avenues throughout the nights. However, even though some may argue that this is a difficult task, but I did not come into this field for my own ease. We have taken the task of trying to discuss different subjects on every single night 
so that even the beginning nights are made use of. Because we find that these 10 nights are those 10 nights that sometimes brothers and sisters that may not attend the Husayniyyah throughout the year come in one of these nights. And as someone who has the duty of propagating and trying to broadcast Islam, these 10 nights are the only real time we get to propagate. Inshallah, we will discuss tomorrow. However, coming back to what I was mentioning, that we need to know the etiquettes of Muharram. We need to know the reason for why we attend these majalis. These majalis, brothers and sisters, are something that were established by the Imams themselves. Crying and weeping for Hussein, peace and blessings be upon him, is something that the Prophet yearned to do. It is something that say the Zahra yearned to do. We come and on behalf of them, we shed our own tears. It's on behalf of the Imam, we come and shed these tears. We remember Hussein. Also, adding on to the point that we mentioned, the sole reason why one attends the majalis is to elevate themselves. Now every individual, brothers and sisters here, they understand themselves better than anyone else. That's why Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, has a very famous saying. He says that, مَنْ عَرَفَ نَفْسَ فَقَدْ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ When a person recognizes themselves, it's only then can they recognize their Lord. An individual knows themselves better than anyone. So everyone knows what level of piousness and piety and God-fearingness they are at. Everybody knows what level of taqwa they have. Everybody knows those areas they need to improve in. Reminds me of when once a companion came to the Holy Prophet and he says, Oh Messenger of God, I went to Hajj, I performed the pilgrimage and I have returned. How do I know that my Hajj was accepted? Because many of us will have the question, how do we know that? We come to the Majalis and our Majalis are accepted. The Prophet turns to the companion and says, if you want to know if God Almighty has accepted your Hajj, he says, look at your character. Your character before you went to Hajj and your character after you come back. If before you went to Hajj, you used to commit sins, you used to lie, you used to deceive people, you used to backbite, etc., now that you have come back from Hajj and you are not performing these sins, know that your Hajj has been accepted. Using this as a principle, brothers and sisters, now that's the first night that we are sitting in, after our Shura, we need to look at our character. And we need to see that after these 10 nights, those sins that we used to commit, are we still committing them? If not, then know that your azadari has been accepted. If you used to lie, and now that you have heard the reports and traditions of the most truthful, you have left lying alone. If you used to backbite, and you became aware of how bad backbiting is, after Ashura you stop, know that your azadari has been accepted. This is a criteria that we can all use. And we pray that this is a means for us to better ourselves. However, our goal is to educate ourselves. And because those that are aware, my line is writing. I'm a researcher. And I try to go into the depth of even very basic things. And with the limited knowledge that I have, I have come to a very easy conclusion. That living in the West, we have too many excuses. 
We have too many complaints. That we can't do this because of this. They don't understand what we're going through. You had heard of these things previously. However, you have to make sure, brothers and sisters, that your main goal is to learn and educate yourselves. Make sure you give yourself this task that when I go to the Husseiniyah, I want to learn something today. We find the books of a hadith and even the Quran verses are full on emphasis about learning. And it's very beautiful how one of the scholars say that these majalis, there's something very much miraculous about these majalis. And that is that they are the open school of Hussein. It's very beautiful what they say. They say that in normal educational schemes, everyone has to attain a certain level before moving on to the next level. For example, one that studies in high school, they are unable to go to college until they have their GCSEs. Is everybody with me? And one who is in university, they can only come into university when they have their A-levels, for example. However, this open workshop or this open madrasa of Hussein, regardless of your age, whether you are old or young, regardless of whether you are female or male, regardless of your culture, whether you are Pakistani, you are Arab, you are Iranian, Afghani, doesn't make a difference. Doesn't matter what your religion is, whether you are Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Sikh, Shia, Sunni, any school of thought, Every background, every level is able to take something away from the school of Hussein. Everybody that comes, whether young, old, male, female, everybody takes something away. And this is the beauty about Karbala. That within Karbala and the caravan of the 72, we find that from every single angle an individual is present. For example, when you want to look at infallibility, you have the Imam there. You have Imam Sajjad there. You have Imam Baqir there. Infallibility. If you want to look at the role of women, you've got someone like Sayyidah Zainab. Brothers and sisters, invite your colleagues, even if they might not be Muslim, Invite them. Those that think that Islam pressurizes women, invite them to these schools that we have. Invite them. Let them hear how much we have to say in credit of women. Our majalis are full of the words of Sayyidah Zahra. Our majalis are full of Sayyidah Khatija, Sayyidah Maryam, Sayyidah Zahra. Our majalis are taken up by these women. May Allah bless them. Throughout the year, the Shias are spoken about. They are cursed. Throughout the year, we hear all of the things you have to say. For these ten nights, come and listen to what we have to say. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Invite them. Don't think that Hussein is just for you. Don't limit Hussein. Don't think Hussein is just for this location, this locality, this individual, this group of people. Hussein is for everyone. That's where we find even authorships and books have been written about those that have spoken about Hussein, those who were influenced by Hussein, those who were influenced by the tragedy of Karbala. Invite these people in, let them hear what we have to say. And we find, brothers and sisters, that these majalis are a series. A series which was established by no one other than the daughter of Ali Zainab. 
You know Karbala It only became Mu'alla As an exalted and high After Hussein came there Shaykh Jafar Shushtari in his Khasal Sul Hussein mentions this Those things that are specific for Sayyid al -Shuhda. And he says that Karbala became Mu'alla Like Mecca Because of Hussein Before that it was a jungle, a barren land A desert No one knew about this place and again, as the poet says, the whole of mankind is indebted to Zainab. You want to know the value of Zainab? Her hijab on one side and the universe on the other. These majalis were established by the sister of Hussein. And what can one say about Zainab? If it wasn't for this great lady, brothers and sisters, Wallahi, we would not be sitting here today. Think. This great lady is whom saved the message of Hussein. If Hussein saved Islam, Zainab saved Hussein. Everywhere you look and turn, and you see people praying, you see people reciting the Quran, you see women wearing hijab, you see men observing the hijab, you see these majalis, know that the origin is Sayyida Zainab. For if it wasn't for her, after the tragedy of Karbala, from Karbala to Kufa and Kufa to Sham, and then back to Karbala and Medina, every place that this grand lady would stop and have the opportunity, she would inform the people about Hussein. And like I mentioned, Within Karbala, if you want to understand the value of relationships, you don't have to look far. Father and son, Karbala. Mother and daughter, Karbala. Mother and son, Karbala. Muslim and Imam, Karbala. Niece and nephew with their uncle, Karbala. Aunties, Karbala. Every uncle, brothers and sisters. We find that... On the first night, it's the tradition in the majority of the majalis for the reciter to recite the farewell of Hussein from Medina. But before I do so, brothers and sisters, historical accounts bear witness that the governor of Medina by the name of Walid he orders for Hussein to pledge allegiance to Yazid. And the messenger from Walid in the darkness of the night comes to Hussein. And he says, O oh Hussein, I am the messenger of Walid, and he has ordered you to come to his court. Hussein says, in our own time we will come. You go, we will come after you. It was shortly after that the same messenger returns to Hussein and says, Oh Hussein, Walid is waiting for you. He says, we are coming. Sayyid Zainab becomes aware that her brother has to go to the court of Walid. So Zainab says, O oh Abbas, I know the intention of these individuals 
and I do not trust them. Abbas, you go with Hussein. Hussein, alongside the youth of Bani Hashim, go to the court of Walid. Zainab couldn't bear that her brother go alone. Imam Hussein says to his companions, he says, O youth of Bani Hashim, I have been ordered to come to the court on my own. Therefore you stand outside. If anything happens, I will raise my voice. If I raise my voice, then come in. Otherwise, stay outside. Hussein enters the court and Walid welcomes him. He shows him a letter by Yazid. He says, Oh Hussein, I have been ordered to take your pledge of allegiance. Hussein becomes enraged. Remember, this is the son of Ali, brothers and sisters. He says, if this is a good act, then why are you asking me to pledge allegiance in the darkness of the night and in a closed room? Why don't we come tomorrow and in the brightness of the day, you ask me the same question and it will become clear whether or not I need to pledge allegiance. Marwan was there also, a very cursed individual. They signaled to one of the guards to kill Hussein. Hussein understood. He puts his eyes into his eyes and says, I'm huwa. Will you kill me or him? After saying this beautifully, putting the enemy in their position, Hussein leaves the court. But because his voice was raised, the youth of Bani Hashim entered. They said, oh master, is everything all right? You raise your voice. Within the narrations and accounts, we don't find who was right at the front of these youth. But my heart says it was no one other than Abul Fadl Abbas. He knew the position of Hussein. After returning, we find brothers and sisters that in the darkness of the night, Hussein begins to walk to the grave of his grandfather, the Prophet. The narrations say that Hussein lies and embraces the grave of his grandfather. He says, Oh, grandfather, your nation, the people of Medina, they don't let me live here. They want me to become distant from your grave. The riwayat say that Hussein cried so much, he fell asleep. And it's in his dream he sees that the grave opens and the Holy Prophet comes to Hussein. He embraces Hussein and he says, Oh Hussein, the time for the fulfillment of that promise you made is close. Inna Allah sha'a an yaraka qatila. Verily God desires to see you killed. O oh, Hussein, God desires to see your women prisoned. Hussein begins to cry. It's very difficult. Leaving your hometown, brothers and sisters, and especially the hometown of Medina, where it was Hussein's grandfather's grave. The grave of his brother and the unknown grave of his mother. Then we find that after he awakens, he begins to walk to the grave of his brother and he weeps at the grave of his brother and he says, Oh brother, this nation no longer allows me to live in this holy city. They are distancing me from your grave, oh brother. Then the riwayat say that when Hussein began to move away from the grave of his brother and intended to go to the grave of Sayyidah Zahra, his mother, the pace of Hussein increased and Hussein threw himself upon the grave of his mother 
like a child throws himself onto his own mother. Allahu Akbar. And he conversates with his mother, Oh mother, how can I leave you? The Muslims no longer want me to live in Medina. I am no longer able to live in Medina, oh mother. My heart says that she would have said, Oh Hussein, don't worry, you are leaving. But I will follow you step by step, oh my son. Then the narrator by the name of Abdullah Al-Maharabi Al-Kufi says that the following day it became clear to me that Hussein was leaving Medina. And I wanted to see the way in which Hussein was leaving Medina. So he narrates that camels were brought forward and a list was made of those men that will be going to Karbala. Abbas, you will accompany me to Karbala. Qasim, you will come with me. Ali al-Akbar, you will come with me. Awna Muhammad, you will come with me. Brothers and sisters, I ask you, how did Hussein tell Ali al-Askar, who was only a few days old, that you will also be coming with me? Then a list was made of those women that will be going to Karbala. This list was given to a maid. The maid would read out the names of those women that would be going and then their mahram would come and help them mount the camels. The narrator says that Hussein had put down a mat where he was sitting and watching everyone getting ready to leave. When the maid began to read the names of the women that were leaving for Karbala, she cried out and said, Layla is amongst those women that will be leaving. Hussein looked at Ali al-Akbar and he says, Oh Ali al-Akbar, go and help your mother mount the camel. Then the maid read the name, Oh, Farwa is coming. Hussein called for Qasim. He said, Qasim, help your widow, widowed mother. Then the maid began to read other names. Amongst the names that were read, the maid says, The daughter of Ali, Umm Kulthum, is coming. Abbas ibn Ali himself leaves where he was and goes to help Umm Kulthum mount the camel. It was shortly after, brothers and sisters, the maid reads the name. Zainab, the daughter of Ali, is coming. The narrator says that Hussein himself stands up and in the grandeur of his sister goes and helps her mount the camel. Brothers and sisters, I ask you, this was the protocol given to Zainab on the time when she was leaving from Medina. But come to Karbala on the 11th of Muharram. It's the same Zainab. No longer is there Abbas and Ali Akbar and Hussein to help her mount the camel. We find that Hussein is no longer there. Abbas is near the riverbank. And Zainab is the one who is helping all the ladies mount the camels. We find that the narration saying that Zainab will put down her knee and she will say, Rabab, mount the camel. Then the next lady would come, she would say, Oh, Farwa, mount the camel. The next lady would come, she would say, Oh, Fitha, come, put your foot on my knee and mount the camel. I ask you, brothers and sisters, the protocol that was given to Zainab when she was bidding farewell to Medina, where was her brother? She must have cried out, Oh, Abbas! Where are you? Look, I am all alone. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'a Wa sayalamu alladhina zalamu Ayyamun qalibin yam qalibun We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our twelfth imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the sins of our parents. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give cure and health to those individuals who are unwell and unhealthy. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to increase and better ourselves in practicing Islam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the ulama and the maraja around the world. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the shrines and mausoleums of the ma'sumeen around the world. Finally, brothers and sisters are requested to recite a Surah Fatiha and Surah Ikhlas thrice for those marhumin and marhumat of those present and especially those who have no longer anyone to recite a Fatiha for them after allowed salawat.